And so I started to think that perhaps I could introduce some play to relax the students. And maybe, maybe if I created a less stressful environment, they would feel free and comfortable to ask additional questions and really feel, get involved with the content. Silviana Falcon spent over 20 years in the health industry uh, before she shifted to higher education, where she applied the same resourcefulness she displayed in corporate to innovate in her teaching. She's now sharing her experience for more than five years in a book titled Lectures and Play. If you are watching this or listening to this, uh, to this interview in the Join the Playful Revolution channel or podcast. And I believe that we need to bring playfulness to the world space. I strongly believe that play unlocks creativity, which is the fuel for innovation. And I also believe that it will bring uh, joy back to the world space. I hope to help increase global creativity and I have interviewed several people for my upcoming book on the topic, and all they tell me is that I have to start in education. Mm -hmm. um, so it happens, uh, things happen in, in uh, the workspace, but the first stage right before the workspace or the workplace is higher education. And that's where exactly Dr. Falcon is uh, applying her teachings and innovating and starting her own playful revolution. Welcome, Dr. Falcon, and thanks for joining the Playful Revolution. I'm going to ask you a few, a few questions. I hope you, you share your best insights. Now, I describe you as someone with a background in health industry, but I, I'd like to ask you exactly, how did a business shark like yourself <laughs> turn into a playful professor and loved by all her students? Can you tell me about how you came into this uh, professional shift? Sure, I'm happy to share with you. I, um, as you mentioned, I've been in the healthcare industry almost all my professional life. So um, just the winds of life brought me to academia. That's a whole different story. But I was in academia. I found myself um, teaching students through lectures, which is basically the format and the model that's worked over many, many years. But one thing I noticed as I was teaching was that the content was certainly being disseminated, right? The students were getting the content, understanding the material, but they were not connecting with it, right? There was not an emotional connection. There was not a desire necessarily to know more and beyond what I was teaching. And that's really what I wanted them to do. I wanted them to ask their own questions, to investigate their own theories. So um, I started thinking about the fact that maybe the classroom setting was too serious, right? I was the one in control, and the students were there to listen and take notes, right? That's the mm -hmm. framework and the model we're all used to. And so I started to think that perhaps I could introduce some play to relax the students. And maybe, maybe if I created a less stressful environment, they would feel free and comfortable to ask additional questions and really feel, get involved with the content. So I started, I, I actually started um, bringing in some training um, methodologies that I knew from the corporate world, right? And so I um, started to see that students engaged and wanted to actually appreciate the fact that they were more, not necessarily leading the discussions, but at least engaging with the content that I was bringing to them at the beginning of the semester. By the end of the semester, this model worked so well that the students were leading discussions, bringing in their own thoughts and ideas which is ultimately what I wanted them to do. 
So bringing in this play in creativity into the classroom has paid a lot of dividends for me and the students, certainly. So, yeah, I, I know you, you found your, uh, the, the difficulties they might be having. They had their troubles and they were not connecting. And you started using uh, play or games, simulations, the debate. But how did you come up with this idea? Is that because in corporate you were using them or, or where did that idea came to you? <laughs> well, I was working in, in corporate, certainly. So I, I knew that we used like um, concepts to um, like icebreakers to get to know each other. It was more of a creating of a culture, creating of a community within the, the workspace. And in the classroom, I didn't see that community, right? It was just me coming in and delivering. There was not this clear understanding that, although I may have more knowledge than the students, obviously, about a particular um, concept, that does not necessarily mean that I should be the only one that shared the the podium, right? So I wanted to give them a little bit more of an authority and feel more responsible for their learning. So I started creating community by bringing in games such as, um, you know, when I begin the semester, I start um, a game or a couple of games that um, one is called the story of your name. So the students, when they They tell me, instead of saying, what's your name, where you come from, you know, the normal or usual type of um, experiences that students have when at the beginning of the semester, I just ask them, what's the story of your name? Why were you named, for example, Sylvia? What was behind that name? Is there a story behind it? So then all of a sudden, the students start sharing a little bit about themselves, and it starts creating that sense of community among them, right? It's just a very interesting, a very simple way to begin creating community. I, I may also ask them, use your name as an acronym, right? S-I-L-B-I-A. And what would it say, right? So for me, it would say, well, she's uh, simple. She is um, ideal. She's loyal, right? She's very vocal. Um, she is innovative. And she's attentive, right? So there you go. That's my acronym. That's who I am uh, in a nutshell. So then the students have a lot of fun with that one as well. So then it starts creating some understanding that my expectation is that they will become an active contributor to the classroom, not just myself. I might bring the theories. I might bring the experience. But they need to be actively contributing to the knowledge of the entire classroom. So that kind of allows me at the beginning of the semester to create that expectation, especially when students come in from other classrooms, even K through 12, they're supposed to just sit and listen, right, and take notes. And they've gotten that very well down pat by the time they get to higher education. So when I tell them that they're going to have to speak, a lot of students get a little bit apprehensive, right, it's, it, especially introverts. So cognizant of that, I start the semester very slowly, engaging students, and then maybe calling on the extrovert a lot more at the beginning, and then slowly. And if there's a student who I can see that they're a little bit more of an introvert, I may call them or send them an email rather ahead of the schedule and say, look, I'm going to call on you this week. Would you like to answer this kind of question? So inviting them and giving them heads up. And then all of a sudden, by the time the semester ends, they all look like extroverts. I mean, they're talking, they're generating ideas, they're challenging each other's thoughts, which is ultimately what I want for that creative thinking. Well, that, that's, that's very good. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed by the, <laughs> the actual exercise. I don't think I can do it. I have to think through with the ñ of my name, Begoña. Oh, yes. <laughs> I don't know many words that they start with that letter. You <laughs> and little bit, I don't know. Um, I was wondering, uh, when you started this, because academia, I know I've been in, in there, and I think it's a traditional environment, like many many corporations anyway. So it's a, it's a natural environment for, I would say, 80% of the workforce anyway. So it's a reality. There's no point on 
criticizing, but what I, what I try to say in my book is make the most of where you are and what you can do. Focus on Absolutely. what you can do and not, not hit yourself against the wall. And there, there are lots of things that can be done in any environment. And those Absolutely. who have a why will find a how, and those who don't will find an excuse. That's what they say. Now, what well, was actually, you know, now that you speak of excuse, I, I, when I started this, I really didn't want anybody to know that I was doing this. <laughs> I was going to ask you about the beginning. How did you get it? This started. Was it noise? Was I, it? <laughs> yes, because you know we are in higher education. Tradition is very important. We follow a lot of traditions as it should be. Nonetheless. I knew that my students were not emotionally and fully connecting with the content. So I started experimenting with these games and activities in the classroom and actually thought I was going to get fired. Like literally, like I was fearful of the fact that somebody would walk into my classroom and see that we were all having fun and say, what is she doing? Right. Is she supposed to be teaching? So I, um, I kept doing it anyway. Ultimately, my fear of getting fired was not going to keep me from doing what I thought needed to be done, which was engage the students, having them really and truly relax and just get those creative juices that are expected in the workplace. I think that's the key. So um, then all of a sudden, the following semester and the following year, I start getting a waiting list to get into my classes and emails from students are stopping by my office saying, would you open up a spot for me? And so I said, you know, I, I was actually thinking about, you know, there are other professors teaching the same course in the regular manner, right? The lecture expected manner. And so they would say, no, 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 my friend told me to take it with you. I need to take it with you because you teach it in such a way that it helps me understand and retain and use my current understanding of the world and layer on top of that the new concepts that you bring into the classroom. And then all of a sudden it went, the light bulb really went on for me, like, oh yeah, I guess that's what I'm doing. Um, the students are really happily engaging with the content instead of me pushing it to them. They're reaching out to me so that I can give them the content they need to create new schemas. Now, that is what I'm talking about, what should education be, what higher education should be about. So kind of in a, in a way, each, each student is leading his own uh, learning path. And you yeah. provide what, whatever they feel they need, because one might emphasize one aspect or they have another one. So you provide an environment. You nudge them a little bit into, come on, you, this is for you. You empower them to be self-learners or self, uh, self-educate self themselves and just Absolutely. provide the environment and and the the tools and the techniques and the content maybe because today in, in this day and age everything is available it's online it's google it's libraries is everything you have at a click of a button uh, so the information is no longer valuable I actually, when I when I go to training, so everything, I'm more interested in seeing, yeah, but how do you apply this? Because I learned about Agile, or I learned about PMP, I learned about this theory. I want to know how do you apply it? What does really apply? Because, you know, that when the theory meets the reality, most of it falls to, to pieces. So you just can remain loyal to the principles and try to apply some techniques or specifics to see if it sticks, but you need to adapt it and get kind of the, the core thinking under the model to see what, what much you can get. It's a tricky thing, and you're preparing people to uh, lead themselves into whatever <laughs> uh, work environment no, not process. The right. Yeah, to not just be passive learners, but rather to say, I am here. I do have something to contribute. I may not know everything there is to be known about a particular subject or a particular thing, but I am a thinking individual. Mm -hmm. I have some some background on something that may actually contribute. And I think it's important in the workplace for us in higher education to help students think this way, right? Creativity and play and relaxing in order to be a more effective team member. 
Let me give you just an example. Yes, so <laughs> I was going to ask you for an example. Okay. Okay. Right. So I, um, one of the really great games that students, um, I'm only a few, but um, that students really like, I talk about planning and the importance of strategic planning for anything, like in our own individual lives and also obviously for business. Strategic planning, planning strategies for the future development of this company, right? So there are a lot of theories about planning. I can talk a lot about the importance of planning. But as humans, especially in this society, we're all about creating solutions, right? We jump to solutions very quickly because we see a problem and we're expected to come to a solution immediately, right? So what I'm trying to teach them is to not do that is to actually think about several different options and strategize to ultimately select the best strategy where all your energy should go, right? Systematically and critically thinking through options. So, sounds good, right? But then what I do is, before I even lecture on planning, I bring marshmallows and I bring... um um, some, um, think of, uh, the spaghetti. Uh, it's a spaghetti, spaghetti challenge. Spaghetti. So then they make spaghetti towers. And we, you know, I give them only those materials, some spaghetti and some marshmallows. And then their objective is to make the tallest tower, freestanding tower. And so they have a lot of fun. I put a lot of music on. We're all dancing, like having a great time. And then I go around and they all get excited as to who's going to win. Mind you, I'm not giving them extra points. This is just for fun, right? And so then we start measuring and then we start talking about, so who won and why did they win? And what kind of strategy did they use? And so on. And one of the things that ultimately we talk about is the fact that they all immediately start building the tower. See, they don't take time to think about how to make the infrastructure of this tower fatter on the bottom and thinner on the top to make sure that it will be freestanding, right? It's mm -hmm. not about necessarily the height of it, but whether the structure and the infrastructure of that tower is strong enough to stand mm -hmm. longer than the rest of the towers in the, in the room. So we start talking about now that is what strategic planning does. And that's why it's so important. And then all of a sudden you see the light bulb of the student come on and say, I understand now why it's important to plan before I act. So you see what I mean? So then all of a sudden we're not talking necessarily about Apple's strategy yet. We're not talking about student strategy. We're not talking about corporate strategies yet. But all of a sudden they realize the importance of pausing for a moment, understanding all viable options before I make a decision as to how to proceed. So boom, it's done, right? And they're all having fun. Their, um, you know, creativity level is high. They're all laughing, having a great time. So by the time I lecture, the room and the energy is ready and ripe to learn. So. That is one of, among the many games that um, I play to connect the lecture content with with the game, right? Once I connect those two, then all of a sudden the lecture and the content becomes one. You, you know what? I, I, a few days ago, I just learned about the Spanish professor at the, my former university, Universidad de la Laguna. He has been nominated as for an award for teaching, and he's applying exactly the same type of tools, gam games, gamification, play into his teaching. And I can't remember his name right now. But uh, there are more and more uh, teachers and lecturers that are applying this. But what do you think is the main cause that is not widely spread already? Because we already know there. Are, if if you are doing it. At the same time, you, you were able to come up with this. The knowledge was there as well. Unless something strike you and you develop an insight. I think it will, I mean, I've been hearing about gamification for 10 years at least. You know, this thing is a trend, at least in my space, in the workspace. And right. I think in learning, uh, project-based learning in primary schools for 10 years or more now, 
in mm-hmm. Spain, everywhere. I mean, it's a trend. 10 or 20 years where we've heard this. But uh, what is stopping it going mainstream? What do you think is the main cause? I think um, one of the major issues that I found in higher education as to why we're not doing it consistently in every classroom, it all boils down to time. Many professors, we've been taught with lectures, right? We understand our content and can speak and go into professor mode at any point, anywhere, at any time, right? We can just um, provide content. It's in our brain. We love it. We understand it. And we, we can talk about it. The issue is that I believe at least the many professors that I work with and that I've um, been interviewed, it's really about time. A lot of our work is um, our work is actually uh, reviewed annually on three different prongs. One is our scholarly activity, our research. Are we able to advance our practice? The second one is our obviously our teaching, and the third one has to do with our service to the college and the community. So usually a lot of pressure is placed on research. So we spend a lot of time doing research and service to the college and the community. And so what happens next is you can't be everything to everyone at all times. So what happens is you go back to your original mode of lecturing because of lack of time. Coming up with these activities and really developing so that they connect beautifully with your lecture takes a lot of time. So, and that's why I wrote this book. That's that's the next question. I know you're very much into the whole topic, so much as to to write a book, but uh, how did you come to to write a book? I know, I guess you're sharing all this material, but tell me more about how the book came to be and more about your your thoughts on it. Well, you know, I, I, I had not intended to write a book, really. I didn't think that my way of teaching or how I was um, bringing the material to life was exceptional. I mean, I didn't think that it was that exceptional, honestly. Um, all, all I knew was that the students were really um, writing really great reviews about my classes. And that years later, I've been teaching for about five years now, and... Um, students from five years ago still write to me saying, do you remember this game? I used it in my work environment today, and it was great. Or do you remember this? I always keep coming back to that concept that you taught. Now, that's four or five years ago, right? So I know that there is power in the games in terms of long-term retrieval of information. So I was looking at, I had a student at the end of one of my classes, stayed back and said, Dr. Falcon, you should really write a book about all of the games and activities that you do. And I started thinking, um, I'm not really sure that I can do that. I mean, I mean, and she said, well, I really think that some other professors could benefit from the way in which you do do lecture and add this play component to it. So I... She was writing a a book at the time herself and connected me with her publisher. And I had a conversation with the publisher and the publisher loved the idea. So I started writing this book about a year ago, especially with COVID. It was at the onset of COVID and I saw it as an opportunity for us to really, we're already changing how we educate students because of COVID. We had no option but to change abruptly and um. 360 degree change about how we did teach. And so I thought, well, what, what if I write this book to give actually examples, exactly like a recipe book? All you have to do is open the book and go see it. Here are the learning objectives. Here's what you do. Here are the materials that you need, which by the way could come out of any pantry, right? Out of any closet. Uh, it's not really that difficult to come to actually develop and, and implement these games. And so I thought, wouldn't it be awesome if we were able to take this opportunity where we're all doing some um, critical thinking and really understanding what it is that we do and our purpose and passion in life? Can, 
can I provide a book that maybe would allow some professors to change the way they teach, right? So that's what this book does. It, it allows, hopefully, a new professor coming in into this arena to rethink and not just go back to what how they were taught and put those pieces together, but actually take additional pieces mm -hmm. and make their classroom a bit more inviting for students. So would it be mostly a, a handbook for pro professors of business subjects? Yes. Or do you think well, actually, somebody else can benefit from it? And it's not just for business. Um, I've had several professors take these games and play in mathematics and physics in education, so you can actually um, play this game in a variety of, of, of subjects, to teach several subjects, so it's not just business. It, it, it makes sense because I'm in business, but um, other professors have used these games very successfully in other, in other areas. And do you think it can transfer to lower levels of education? Absolutely. So it could be, yeah, that's what, so you're providing actually what is stopping people. It's like, if I give you the recipe, you just have to follow the recipe. I've done the right. heavy lifting of researching what games for what subjects, what times, you know, that kind of how to pace it. Do you have a kind of a curriculum, like, to teach this thing, you have to go on this and this and that? Is it tied to to subject? No, not really, no? Oh, so it's, yep. It actually is tied to, I provide a listing of, different subjects that you can teach okay. with this particular game. Um, the student learning objectives, which are very important for our area, and also even a sample of a lecture. This is what you could cover, right? This is how you could start. This is where you would introduce the lecture. So sometimes I play the game, and on the back end, I start the lecture for 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes I play the game lecture and finish the game and sometimes I start with a lecture and then the rest of the time is the game connecting those two. So it does, so this allows professors, I hope anyway, an opportunity to begin experimenting with already child and true games and then maybe my hope is that they will develop their own game. Right now that they felt what it's like, mm -hmm. and then literally, you be, I cannot lecture anymore without a game. <laughs> yeah, I just want, I have one question about this, and um, I think being kind of the black hat now, the creative black hat. How do you evaluate learning? Because if they spend most of the time, I gather from your distribution of time, they spend 20 to 30 percent content related, up to 70 percent game or play activity, practical uh, playfulness or something. So how do you evaluate? Is it continuous? Do they assessment test? is yeah. very important. Obviously. How do you do it? Right. It's not right. a game? Right. Do you assess through play too? <laughs> or do I, they sit a test? Well, interestingly, I've not gotten to that point yet, although I would want to. Um, but one of the things that I do is I do not use multiple choice questions. I think, you know, the question is, the, the, the answer is staring you right at the face. Right, it's very simple, and it only, I believe, um, requests the students or invites the students to memorize information. Is that's not what I want? Theory can do that for. Us. What I want them is to connect different dots. So my exams are all written, and so and it's not just about one topic. I give them a scenario and then have them pull everything they see from that scenario based on what they now know. So it takes a lot of time for me to review their exams, but it's a more engaging way of understanding what they've now learned. So I can see when students can connect all the dots. To me, more, more important it is to assess how all these dots connect rather than each individual dot. To me, that's just not as important. I'm thinking that maybe since you have built this whole uh, playful ecosystem, learning ecosystem, to get them th into thinking, <laughs> the, the evaluation, the assessment has to be done through show me how well you think, not just concept, 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 facts. Right. Yeah, I know. Right. Those, hmm. those are not lower level thinking. Um, and it dissipates immediately after they dump that information onto the exam. That's not what I'm about. Um, so it's, it's 
I can tell you, it's very um, helpful for me to see students who've gone on to become managers. One of the classes that I teach is management. And so who are very successful managers out there, I see them on LinkedIn and I see them applying the concepts that I've taught. And then they write to me saying, I applied X, Y, and C today, and the outcome is great. Thank you for making me feel, you know, for making me a better person. Ultimately. Well, I think that's the best uh, acknowledgement or, let's say, evaluation of your teaching style. Like more than any official awards, and I know you've earned some, but it's, it's this one, seeing that applied into the, into the arena. <laughs> Absolutely. Say, that yeah. is really the fuel that I need to keep doing this work because it really takes a lot of hours of work to be able to connect and easily have the students transition from a game into content and vice versa. Mm -hmm. That it takes a lot of time to plan and it takes a lot of time to come up with a game that is not going to fall flat on its face, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're actually going to have fun and that they're going to engage in and that they're going to remember. Yeah. Right. And connect all the dots. So it takes a lot of time to do that. Um, but I think what an awesome way to start higher education so that whenever they get to the workplace, not only are they expecting that playful revolution, as you call it, right, that they're not going to just be robots expected to just follow direction, that they're going to be expected to think as they should as humans, right? And to contribute to a team and to have fun doing it. Otherwise, why do it? Yes, I'm so I'm so with you. That's why you're here, actually. <laughs> Self-selected uh, interviewee. Just one final question to to sure. end. Um, I could I could actually ask you directly. What legacy would you like to leave in the world? But before I do that, I'll give you another way of formulating this. I'm going to emulate uh, Louis Holmes, who has a, a podcast of, of his own, the uh, School of Greatness, I think it's called. And he asked people at the end of the interviews, um, okay, you came to the end of your life, <laughs> you've done everything you could, and you're going to leave with nothing empty-handed, uh, but you can only pass on three pieces of knowledge, your message, your three things to pass on, your wisdom, your message. What would you like to leave behind? or tell people your learning, just three key learnings uh, as to as far to us now, <laughs> I guess. Well, that's a loaded question, but it's a very good question. I think ultimately we're here in this world to make a difference, right? And mm -hmm. so I, I like to tell my students through my management class that we're managers. Obviously we do have power, right? You always have power one way or another in the workplace. The problem is how to use that power. And the power really should be used to raise other people, right? To lift them up. That's what we're here to do is to lift people up. So my legacy, I think, I hope anyway, is that ultimately at the end of the day, I'm helping them become better humans and look beyond themselves look outside and see how they themselves can contribute to increase our humanity. Um, you know, all these concepts and all these things, all the mathematical strategies or things of that nature that I teach become relevant if we can't really treat each other with kindness. So I think that's ultimately my legacy, or I'd like to see as one of my legacies, and that would be that they become better humans. Um, and that they've raised people up and looked for ways in which they can augment people's capacity rather than diminish it. We're very good at doing that in the workplace. Yeah, well, um, I'm not surprised you, you answered this. <laughs> you <laughs> seem to be, um, from my interaction with you before uh, preparing the interview and, and everything, I think you are a very kind person and devoted to the cause enough to do the extra mile, go the extra mile and do this. Um, lessons, playful lessons. So I appreciate that from the receiving end of that people that benefit directly from you. Uh, because I'm in the workforce and we need more people coming and demanding and leading the playful revolution. Because I mm -hmm. think um, we are here because people did, did the right things that needed to be done in the past. 
But now times are changing and we need a different way of doing things. We need playfulness more than ever. I'm so proud and happy and I mean, it's music to my ears, everything you've been doing for the past five years. And I think if you can show us your book uh, that is coming in like soon in August, uh, yes, Lectures and Play is the handbook for professors of any subjects, uh, mostly business, but it could be used for maths, uh, physics and many others at least as an inspiration of how things can be done and as a resource tool so you don't have to do the, the big effort of thinking, what do I do? If I want to bring uh, my, my playfulness into my, my classroom, can I start just with one experiment, a little experiment one day to see what, how it's received? How would you recommend, give them a, a, a tip of how to get started to these people think, just to say, to I finish think off? it's important. Um, I, and I provide that in the book, is to start slow. Um, you can't just bring in a game and expect everybody to be joyful and expecting to get engaged, right? Because we haven't done it for so long, right? Students have learned to sit quietly, and that's how they get A's, by sitting quietly and not, you know, and taking notes. They don't get A's by having fun. So there's that initial hesitancy by the students that I found, right? Not, 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 not 100%. Some students do come from project-based schools that are very used to this kind of an environment, but not everybody is. So you've got to give a little bit of an opportunity for the students to feel, invite them into the conversation as if you were inviting someone to your dinner table, right? It's, it's, it, it's, it's difficult at first. You don't know them. You, you don't understand really what they're expecting of you. So you need to start working on, especially when grades are so important, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're tied to scholarships. They're tied to all these things. So it, it you don't stress. understand. That's stress right? to their, yeah, to their learning. So I think if I were to do it, if I were a brand new professor, I'd read the book to make sure to integrate activities into slowly, right? And then by the time you get one third of the semester down, then the students are primed to continue to increase that level of engagement. But by the time, you know, by the time I walk into the classroom on the latter part of the semester, the students are saying, what are we going to play today? Right? So it's already, they're primed, they're ready, they're ready to go. They know that they're going to be touching, feeling the content. So, um, it, you create that initially gradual steps to get there. So hopefully this book will allow somebody to um, to start creating those steps and then getting into into these things. I have a question, teacher. <laughs> no, I forgot. How did you move everything up to remote? Or have you been teaching um, physically? So remote does create a lot of difficulties, obviously, right? Um, it's very difficult to do that. And the book does speak a little bit about the online environment. I happen to believe that it's very difficult to create relationships, long-standing good relationships over the phone or over Zoom. But they're not impossible. Like, we've never met before. And I feel like I already feel like I can talk to you just about anything, right? So I think it's important for professors to create the environment. And some of these games can be played online. Um, because we utilize and soon we look at breakout rooms. So there's a lot of things that we can do um, to get them engaged and talking. And so, again, um, actually, I think the online environment allows our professors to see themselves teaching. And because we have the big audio tape or record it, and if we can actually honestly pay attention to how we teach, not only how we teach, but how the students are reacting. Right. So I can tell you my students, when I teach, they're all, I can see them all. Right? I don't have to remind them, put your video on because I'm engaging them. I'm asking questions. Tell me what you think. Tell me how you would see it differently. Is there another angle to see this problem from? And so all of a sudden, they're all like going. They want to be a part of it. So um, it is very difficult. I'm glad that hopefully we won't necessarily continue on an online environment. 
but it does present a lot of challenges for sure. Yeah, just just a question, a detail, a minor one. How many students do you normally teach in a classroom, a given classroom? Because that makes a big difference, both in physical uh, settings and in, uh, remote. It does make a big difference. So um, I teach anywhere between 30 to 45 students per class, and the 45 is maximum. Um, that's way too many um, because I I remember their names. Like by the first, I play a few games, and by the time my second or third lecture, I already know everybody's name because it helps me. You know, if you tell me the story of your name, it's very likely that I'm going to remember your name by the story that you just told me, mm -hmm. and I won't forget it. So not only am I creating an environment in which they understand a little bit about each other, but it's helping me remember your name. So then all of a sudden, when it, the students are coming in or I ask a question, I can ask the question, oh, where is Begonia today? I haven't seen her. Is there something, should we wait for her, right? And that's another thing that I request my students to do is to text me. If they're going to be late, if they're running late, they need to text me. If they need to leave early, they need to text me and let me know. Not because I'm um, micro, um, is it, um, micro micromanaging, but rather because I've invited them to my table. And just like a friend of yours whom you've invited to lunch, you would wait for them to before you started eating. So, you know, that's there, I have 100% attendance to my classes, even at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's not wow. unheard of for higher education. I'm not right? surprised. It's unheard of. <laughs> get up that early, especially for finance, right? But they're coming in. They want to be a participant in the conversation. So I think that's why I'm very um, happy that I took the time and the effort to write this book. Honestly, because I want to raise other professors up. I want them to feel that wonderful feeling that is felt when you leave the classroom and the students enjoy what they just went through. Now, that is a feeling. I cannot describe it, but you know it when you get it. Hmm. And, and you want to replicate it. And I want to raise them up so that they can feel the same thing. Yeah, it sounds familiar, the feeling of, I have this, I have enjoyed this, I want everybody else to be able to enjoy the same. It's, yeah, it's, I had a, a similar experience myself. It's very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, just to finish off, but I had one question before, kind of to, to close the, the thing. But, uh, what's the, the finish, the ending words you would like to leave people? Because uh, from what you say, yeah, I know. Uh, you work in a specific uh, higher education in the United States with specific context, um, up to 40, 50 people. I did my degree and we were 200 people. Obviously, right. the, the model was a uh, master lecture and, and so on for practicality reasons anyway. But I don't think it's impossible. I think, I hope from my side, that your book is the beginning. It will inspire people who are not exactly in your same conditions to to talk with you, join forces, and challenge you to help them to adapt the format to whatever context they have. Adapt it. This is just it's an inspiration. It's already started Yeah. with lecture halls of 200 and 300 students. What they've done is that they, they, let, they record their lecture for the content, and then they come in and play utilizing some of their, their um, teacher assistants, you know, to, to segregate students yeah, into smaller groups, groups yeah. and, and really get to the content and feel the content, not just introducing the content. So there are some ways in which professors have done that. I'm just very lucky that I'm in an environment that mm -hmm. is smaller and I have a little bit more control. But even 45 students is quite large teach yeah. a finance course um, that is heavy math oriented. But, you know, it can be done. The, the key, I think, that is important to remember is that not to let fear and fear alone dictate your, your, your condition, right? Um, had I been, had fear taken over me, right, and, and fearful of being fired, I've never been fired from a job before, Fearful of being fired would have kept me from really engaging the students in such a way for their own benefit. So I think one of the most important things I think is to 
cannot not let fear or let the current condition define your future condition. Okay, well then I'll, now I'm sure I'm going to wrap up. <laughs> My conclusion here, advice for listeners who can find themselves in a teaching position, lecturing position, is if you don't see how this could apply to you, talk to Dr. Falcon, uh, email her, whatever, and see how you can apply it in your context to find a way to make it possible rather than see, because her context is not like mine, it doesn't apply. No, let's see what do we have to do to be able to apply this and be creative with that. And I'm getting you into, <laughs> into trouble on this. That's for our audience. But I wanted to summarize the thing. You started five years ago with fear of being fired. Can you tell me, the car, five years on, this experience, how the thing has fired, how it has ended, apart from writing a book? <laughs> well, you know, interestingly, um, three years into it, I received um, the highest award that is given to a faculty member at a university, uh, and it's driven by student choice. So um, the students chose to toast me out of 300 plus faculty members um, to be given this award. So for my teaching, excellence in teaching. And then I received a national award as well for coaching students to become better entrepreneurs. So it's That's a good, that, and like a year later, I received um, uh, one of the highest awards given in terms of um, not teaching necessarily, but overall performance, I received another award by the university. So. Um, and only less than 1% of the faculty members receive that award. So, all so you, you keep your job. <laughs> it's working. Whatever it is I'm doing. And, you know, it's funny because I'm having a lot of fun in the classroom. Like, it doesn't, I look forward to going to the classroom because I'm going to laugh. I'm going to have a great time. We're going to all engage in the conversation and really devote time to understanding and talking about a topic from different perspectives, even from perspectives I may not have thought of, but I know the content well enough that if a student would look at it from a different perspective, I can change that in my brain and respond to it. And if I don't know it, I love it when I say, I don't know, but I'll get back to you, because they can see that I'm, even though I have a PhD, there's much more to be known then my brain can hold, right? So the fact that I am showing them that I'm human too, but I want to know. Mm -hmm. I want to be inquisitive. And that's something that should never end, right? Should never end in our life. So you probably learn as much as you teach in the classroom. <laughs> Unequivocally. Yes. Well, that should be it for today. I think it's been a, a very juicy interview. Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and your humor. And your playfulness. I'm so happy somebody got started already in education <laughs> because it's, it's what we need. We, we need to join forces. And that's why we created the channel as well to, to make more people uh, uh, get familiar with all these things that are already done. You know, you, you've been doing this for five years. Let's make it amplify the message because the more people get to, to your book, the more, the faster they can apply it or adapt it or something. And with less load on their side, you know, make it easy. Are you planning a translation soon to Spanish, maybe? I am looking at that, yes. Um, maybe translating it into Spanish. My family is also in um, Spanish-speaking countries, so I'd love for them to be able to read what I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and also some professors in other universities. I'd love to be able to see what they're doing within their culture mm -hmm. um, and maybe invite them to help me understand and evolve as a teacher as well. I have a lot to learn from them as well. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Falcon, for your visit. And I hope to hear a lot more from you in the near future. Thanks a lot. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate yes. it very much.